we're going to go ahead and get things started. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to kick it off by passing it to Christina Ishmael, who's the Deputy Director of the Office of Education Technology. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, we are glad to have you and are excited about um, introducing our panelists and getting to the meat of why we're here um, in just a few moments here. So my name is Christina Ishmael, my pronouns are she and her, and I serve as the Deputy Director of the Office of Ed Tech at the U.S. Department of Education. In case you didn't know that we are here, we are here and we are here to serve you. Um, we have actually been here since 1996 when Congress um, mandated that we exist. And so we developed national ed tech policy. And thankfully for our, our colleagues in the late 90s who saw that this was going to mean something in technology. So um, we are excited to kick off this conversation um, about ed tech evidence. If we can go to the next slide, I'd love to, to kind of share how we're thinking about our time together. So we firmly believe that OET has a responsibility to catalyze important national conversations about how educational leaders and developers and researchers engage with evidence to inform ed tech adoption in schools. Then our perspective at OET, of course, is that schools are and should be active participants in using evidence to inform adoption decisions about technology use in schools. If you are familiar with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, ESEA, or ESSA, as we may know it, elementary, <laughs> um, ESSA from 2015 that actually talks about using um, the four tiers of evidence to make these decisions, that's what we're, we're going back to and we're referring to that. So as a department, we believe that it's our responsibility to provide the resources and guidance to support partnerships and amplify schools' evidence building efforts. And we know that that can be hard, especially with ed tech, because the technologies change so quickly. Um, so we are looking at the following questions in our time together here. How do we define evidence building, particularly in relation to educational research and development? What are the qualities, benefits, and challenges of successful real-world ed tech evidence building partnerships between schools, researchers, and developers? And then how can educational leaders across government, industry, and academia support schools' engagement in evidence building partnerships? So we know that there are a number of questions to get to. Uh, we also recognize that we have a finite period of time together. So one of the um, kind of community agreements that we have here on our team at the Office of Ed Tech is expect and accept a lack of closure um, because we will undoubtedly run out of time. <laughs> and we know that these conversations can certainly continue um, long afterwards. So we look forward to engaging with you all, not only here today in our time together, but hopefully in other ways after, after this webinar comes to an end. So I would like to um, just look at our agenda really fast. As I mentioned, here's kind of what we're thinking here. Um, obviously, we are already in the welcome. We're going to set the stage with Dr. Yana Prado and Dr. Pati Ruiz. Um, then we'll go into the conversation. So if you signed up for this, thank you. <laughs> um, but you might have seen that it said listening session. And so there's going to be an opportunity for us to listen to the panelists talk about the different questions that we have to present to everyone. But then there's also the opportunity for you all to engage. Um, this was our, our a good way for us to be able to present the information, but then also bring you in as part of the presentation itself. Again, we know that we will not get to everything, so we hope that we can continue to, um, to be able to engage after this. So please make sure that you use the chat, the polls, any of that information um, coming along, raise, raise your questions, whatever the case may be. We want to see as much engagement in a webinar as possible. Um, I would love to be able to turn it over to Yenda and Fati now to set the stage and get us started. Welcome everyone. My name is Yenda Prado and I'm the Emerging Tech uh, Impact Fellow at OET. As the evidence lead, I develop resources for OET's EdTech Evidence Toolkit and I will be co-facilitating uh, today's session with my colleague, Patti. Thank you, Yenda. Hello, everyone. My name is Patti Ruiz, and I'm a senior research scientist at Digital Promise. I'm on the Learning Sciences Research Team, and my research focuses on emerging technologies. And as people continue to introduce themselves in the chat, 
we're gonna we're gonna activate our first poll. So Gabrielle, can you please activate our first poll? And as Christina mentioned earlier, also please drop your questions in chat in Zoom or using the Zoom Q and A feature. So our first question is in Poll Everywhere. You'll see a link at the top, pollev.com slash V-I-L-S, and Gabrielle or Sana will be dropping that link into chat. Um, you will text uh, your response to the following question. What challenges have you had establishing whether the ed tech in your school, district, or organization is evidence-based? So while we have that poll going, I'm going to pause and ask Yenda and our panelists to come on camera so that they can introduce themselves. So we'll stop the poll for now so that we can see everyone's faces. We would love uh, to have all our panelists introduce themselves. If you can share your name, your institution, and a quick blurb about what you're looking forward uh, with today's conversation, that would be wonderful. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. Um, shout out to our West Coasters who are joining us. Um, I'm Erin Moat. I'm the executive director of Innovate EDU. You might not know Innovate EDU, but you definitely know some of our projects, whether that's Project Unicorn, the work we do on data interoperability, the EdTech Evidence Exchange, the work we do to bring information about the context of the implementation of EdTech in the work, or maybe you know our work with Birdie, the blueprint for inclusive research and development and education to add more organization to the research we already have. At Innovate EDU, we're really focused on closing the distance between policy, research, and practice. And I'm really excited to talk less today and to listen more to folks a little bit about what struggles they're having in their districts and potentially what resources we can connect folks to as we build this age of evidence in ed tech. Dr. Shu, can you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm pleased to be here um, today. My name is Ying Xu, and I'm an assistant professor of learning sciences and technology at the University of Michigan. Um, so my team and I focus on designing and evaluating educational technologies with a special interest in AI applications for teaching and learning. Um, so in our projects, we usually take a um, very collaborative approach and prioritize building strong partnerships with a diverse array of stakeholders, including students, schools, community organizations, media producers, and ad tech companies. Um, so I look forward to sharing some of our experiences with all of you today. Thank you. Uh, Sunil? Hey there. Hi, how is everyone? And um, I'm Sunil Gandhari, Chief Innovation Officer of Age of Learning. But after what Aaron says, maybe we'll change our name to Age of Learning plus Age of Evidence. Um, we are known for ABC Mouse, which is used by over 50 million young learners worldwide. And um, what we've done is really leverage our knowledge on how to successfully engage young children in learning to build a learning engineering process to create a new generation of learning solutions. And these solutions, My Math and My Reading Academy, are not only deeply rooted in research, both, both have research-based design and learner variability certifications from Digital Promise, but also evidence of effectiveness. And um, as across the two solutions, we now have 10 ESSA validations, having received our latest validation from Learn Platform just last Friday. So uh, hooray for us. Um, and we're excited to be leading the way on how evidence-based approaches to developing ed tech will change outcomes for, for all students and uh, look forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Monique. Hi, I'm Monique Davis. Um, I'm the executive director at El Sol Science and Arts Academy. We're a pre-K through eight um, school in Santa Ana, California. We're a dual immersion school, science and arts academy. We've got a lot going on. Uh, we're also uh, what's called an ocean partner of University of California, Irvine, where um, 
between UCI and, and its community partners, there's, there's a bridge for research and practice um, that provides an actionable partnership. Um, and and uh, I'm excited today to talk about some of the work that we're doing in that space and, and why we think it's important as a, as a public school and um, uh, some of the experiences, benefits, challenges, et cetera, and learning from all of you. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Soldner. Hey, Yenta. Hey, everyone. It is great to see you. Uh, my name is Matt Soldner. I'm commissioner here at the U.S. Department of Education's Institute for Education Sciences in our National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance. It is great to have such wonderful friends on this panel and to see so many of you in the audience. Um, like Aaron, I am really keen to listen today and hear how it is that particularly myself and my colleagues here in IS can support states and districts in their efforts to build and use evidence. Uh, so although I will try to listen more than I talk, I also hope to be able to share some resources with you all. If I can multitask, I will try to put some things in the chat that I hope you're aware of. Um, if I can multitask, I'll work with you and to make sure you all get those after the call. But thank you so much for choosing to take some time with us. Um, I appreciate seeing you all here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introductions, everyone. Um, we are going to go back to the poll because we did get some good responses. Again, the question was, what challenges have you had establishing whether the ed tech in your school district, school district or organization is evidence-based? And um, we're not gonna show the poll right now, but some of the responses that came in there were, having an agreed upon definition of what ed tech evidence is. Um, we don't know where to go for the info was another comment. Lack of time to research. And also we got, it's hard to get efficacy reports on new ed tech. So with those initial thoughts in our head, I'm gonna turn it back over to Yenda and our panelists um, so that she can ask an, an initial background question for us. Thank you. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. Uh, and thanks, Spati, for handing it over. Um, I'd like to provide a little additional context for why we're doing the listening session. As Christina mentioned, ESCA encourages schools to prioritize evidence-based interventions. As a result, uh, education leaders asked OET for guidance on how to use evidence to inform their ed tech adoption. In response, uh, we developed the EdTech Evidence Toolkit as a resource that schools could use to partner with state and local leadership, developers, as well as researchers in their use of evidence. The toolkit provides background knowledge for understanding ESCA's four tiers of ed evidence, presents a practical school district case study with evidence building activities, and highlights partnership strategies that support the use of evidence in schools. Next slide. The toolkit provides a framework for schools to partner with organizations in their use of evidence to inform ed tech adoption by identifying educational needs, determining what evidence exists, and developing an evidence building strategy. We hope that we can use the information uh, that we gain from today's listening session to inform uh, future resources that we will be developing for the toolkit. And with that, I am going to turn now to Matt and Aaron for our initial question to provide a broader picture of what's happening in education research and development with regard to evidence. Matt, I am going to start with you. Could you please discuss how the department defines evidence and how terms like evidence, data, research align and differ? Also, how is the department supporting different constituents in their use of evidence? Yeah, thanks, Yenta. Uh, those are some great questions. We could have a whole webinar just dedicated on that, but I promise I will, right. I will not take all this time. So, you know, every quarter I give a presentation to our new colleagues here at Ed uh, about what evidence is. We're talking about evidence um, and using it in uh, informing our policymaking. And so I always tell them that evidence is high quality information used to inform decision making created when appropriate analytic methods are applied to trustworthy data. And so you asked how the words evidence and data research kind of align and differ. And so, so using those words, 
evidence is built through the research process, which uses high quality data as an input. So they are all different, but they're part of this larger effort to build evidence. Now, I want to be clear, we're talking about evidence as if um, evidence uh, is a sort of monolithic or singular thing. There are really different kinds of evidence out there for really very different purposes. And I'm pretty confident many of those are going to come up today um, in our conversation. So I want to think specifically, at least in my conversation, about evidence of effectiveness. And some of your poll responses began to get to this. You know, questions about what works, what moves the needle for important student outcomes that we care a lot about. So, uh, Yenda, you evoked uh, ESSA and uh, kind of the Every Student Succeeds Act and, and how that uh, influences folks' use of evidence in the classroom. You probably know, or most folks on the line probably know, that as part of the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015, Congress set out a basic framework for all of us to think about what evidence was when we're talking about an effective practice or an effective policy or an effective product. And they created these ESSA evidence standards, which probably all of us by now are familiar with. We probably have heard about uh, ESSA tier one evidence or strong evidence, uh, moderate evidence tier two, promising evidence tier three, or evidence of effectiveness that demonstrates a rationale. And so Congress gave us these four levels of evidence from the highest, most rigorous, all the way down to begin to set some standards for what evidence of effectiveness means. And from that, the department put some uh, meat on the bones of the law that Congress gave us. And so you probably are familiar with these ESSA evidence standards as reflecting um, evidence of varying qualities and different types of research that's done to establish uh, a certain kind of tier of evidence. So strong evidence, our highest level of evidence, is that which we divine or get um, created through the use of randomized control trials. Moderate evidence, um, things that are uh, built through the use of quasi-experimental designs. Promising evidence, another kind of research, correlational studies, and then evidence that demonstrates a rationale um, based upon a logic model. Now, most of us are not familiar with how to do this work. And one reason I am so excited to be here with Yenda and the OET team today is that they have created some incredibly accessible resources to begin to help you think about how to build evidence that meets varying levels of the ESSA um, evidence guidelines. So this truly is um, a, a great collaboration and opportunity um, to share these resources with you guys. Now, Absent the great work OET has done, my colleagues and I and IES, um, and really department-wide, are supporting folks to use evidence in a variety of ways. So I hope all of you have seen um, a document that is now um, a little bit long in the tooth, but still really high quality, our non-regulatory guidance in using evidence to inform education investments. And here's where my multitasking skills are or are not going to become apparent. Let me see if I can put some resources in the chat for you guys. Okay, I guess I can. All right, so this non-regulatory guidance is wonderful in that it provides a great process for helping folks think about finding and using evidence to improve education outcomes. If you haven't seen that PDF, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Second, once you've had a chance to dig into that PDF and you want to think about where is it that I can find information on what we know about what works through high quality evidence, I hope you have been to our What Works Clearinghouse website. That's a product and service operated by my colleagues here in IES. And if you've been to our website at whatworks.gov, you know that we review high quality research and we synthesize that high quality research into practice guides for educators that summarize high quality research and intervention reports. Um, reports that summarize what we know about works about name branded interventions. So if you haven't been to whatworks.ed.gov, I would strongly encourage you to check it out. And if you have feedback to get back in touch with me. Second, 
Um, if you are needing more support beyond a website, you need more sort of direct uh, kind of technical assistance, I'd encourage you to work with your regional educational labs. Reach out to the regional educational labs. You can learn more about them at is.ed.gov backslash rels, and they partner with states and districts and learning about evidence-based practices um, and uh, instantiating them in their, in their practice. Now, that's about finding evidence. We also want to support folks in building evidence. So again, I want to applaud OET. Yenda and her team have been an incredible set of collaborators in helping us think about how we can develop tools to make it easier for folks to build evidence on the ground. So you can document what's effective in your own local context. We also have great short videos on our WWC website about how to meet standards of evidence set forth by ESSA and the department. And we have full-fledged resources. So I'll put two more things in the chat. Um, if you want to think about building evidence of effectiveness in your local context, and you want to launch a pilot study, our REL Appalachia put together this great resource on how to do that work in the chat. If you feel like you need a more full-fledged course in how to evaluate a program, REL Central put together this wonderful resource about program evaluation. And as part of that, you can also um, dig into um, how to build a logic model. So I think I've talked long enough. Um, <laughs> needless to say, the department has resources um, on both how to build and use evidence. And if you have questions or feedback on any of them, we'd love to hear it. I mean, either right now, um, today's webinar or after our time together. Thank you so much, Matt, for providing the additional context of what the department means when they say evidence and being evidence-based. Erin, I am going to turn to you now. Um, can you tell us, how are the various players in the EdTech universe engaging with the notion of evidence in relation to education R&D? Also, what trends are you noticing and what do we need to do to support partnership work in this space? Well, um, thanks, Matt, for doing the hard thing, which is defining evidence um, and, and doing that work. I really appreciate it. Now let's talk about how it's being used in the field and what's actually happening and why I'm calling it an age of evidence um, in ed tech right now. So I think the thing that everyone on this call can get really excited about is that evidence is really being the thing that districts, vendors, providers, and policymakers are really, really paying attention to and thinking about how we can build those support structures in the research and development ecosystem. And not just basic research, right, about tools or trends, but now applied research. What does this look like when we're trying to actually implement tools and practices. And so a couple of places I'm going to divide my comments for districts, for vendors and solution providers, and then for policymakers in terms of what I am seeing. So I'm seeing districts more and more excited about entering into research practice partnerships. And that is phenomenal. These are partnerships between universities and districts, LEAs, or maybe a consortium of districts and uh, folks in a state maybe who are really thinking about what's a core research question, what's something we want to understand and delve deeper into, and how can we partner with our local colleges and universities to do that? And not just big R1 universities, but one of the things that's really exciting is really the rise of local community colleges, HBCUs and MSIs, who are really stepping forward and thinking about some of the most pressing problems in their community. So the rise of RPPs, the other thing I really am going to focus on today is the rise of outcomes-based contracting. And I'm going to share some um, resources actually from one of the comprehensive centers that IES um, has put forward around strategic budgeting and outcomes-based contracting. So whether you are a district in Ector County, Texas, or your Denver Public Schools, or San Antonio USD, all districts who have found a way to implement outcomes-based contracting. And so what is that? That is basically when a district decides to partner, to put out an RFP for a solution. And then with the solution provider, they're not just saying, does the solution 
Do we think this solution is going to fit? But they have a dedicated conversation about what outcomes do we want to see from using this solution? What's the context in which this solution is going to be implemented? What's our job as a district in terms of implementation? And then what is the solution provider or vendor's responsibility in terms of their implementation? And if everybody lives up to their agreement, not only does the solution provider get the full sort of size of the contract, but if the solution provider doesn't, the district is able to say, hmm, we didn't meet this bar. Here's where maybe we fell down. Here's where the solution provider fell down. We're actually going to reconsider the solution. So it's not just using evidence to make a decision, as Matt was talking about, but then it's using the mechanisms that you have available to you to then say, this decision worked for us or does it? It creates this opportunity for evaluation using procurement tools. And so I really see um, solution providers and vendors getting excited about and willing to interact um, with districts in this way, because it brings up this critical question, which is, what are the what is the context that surrounds the implementation of a successful ed tech product being used in a district? And also creates questions for, is this product meant to be used for all students? Or is it meant to, is it, does it get great outcomes for a subset of the population? Is this a great tool for our English language learners? Is this a great tool for our students with disabilities? Is this a great tool for our occasionally connected students? How are we using these tools and not assuming that all tools are used within the same context? And this is really valuable insight that we've gained through the work of the EdTech Evidence Exchange. And I'm so excited to see actually some of our folks from our industry council on this call, folks who are really committed in the vendor community to having this conversation around what's the context of our ed tech implementation happening in the field. There's 10 variables that through research we've identified at ed tech evidence exchange that say these are the things you need to be thinking about when you're implementing ed tech in your environment. They can be everything from how much do you spend on professional development to what's the structure of decision making and the leadership. And so that is making this decision too. How interoperable is this solution or how does this solution fit into our existing tech stack? There's also some phenomenal work that's going on at the policy level. And I'm gonna acknowledge three, three great things that are happening right now in the policy level. The toolkits are awesome, Yenda and the folks at OET. I'm gonna add my shout out to those here. But also we're seeing some great toolkits and I'm gonna share one from the comprehensive centers on how to use budgeting, the tool of budgeting and outcomes-based contracting when you're considering evidence. We see the state of Connecticut standing up an, an evidence hub with their um, CARES dollars to help create a, a statewide conversation around the most effective tools in their state, most effective practices. Or we see at the federal level, our colleagues at the Senate Health Committee opening up a conversation about what ESRA, and what's happening, updating a law that hasn't been updated in 20 years, potentially, about 20 years, y'all. Um, what is happening in evidence in our space? What can we be doing to be more responsive to schools and districts and solution providers around evidence? And so trends, embracing the age of evidence, districts using some of their business tools like procurement or outcomes-based contracting to engage in the evidence conversation and create checks around the implementation of ed tech and whether or not it's working or the implementation of pedagogy and practice of whether or not it's working and i'm really seeing that and um, at the in the tutoring space right now in a huge way um, folks asking questions about are these services being used how are they being used so on and so forth and then finally you asked me the most important question which is how do we better support schools and districts, states and policymakers in embracing this age of evidence. So a couple things, we need to make the information easier to digest and to engage with. And so we, we have a base of evidence, how do we make it usable and actionable and ready to engage with? And so not only is there the great work of the What Works Clearinghouse and the practice guides, including some that were immediately responsive during the COVID-19 pandemic, but there's also coalitions of organizations coming together to share that information 
Digital Promise, the EdTech Evidence Exchange, Project Unicorn, the Center for Education Market Dynamics, and ISTE have all entered into a consortium to make their certifications and information about EdTech products more visible. And so right now, if you go to the ISTE Ed Surge Product Index, you'll actually see information about Digital Promise certifications, whether or not someone has has the Project Unicorn certification for interoperability. And hopefully, eventually we'll grow that so that you don't have to go to eight different websites to figure out what certifications or what pieces of the pie, the decision-making pie for privacy, interoperability, Evans Eight's best practice, accessibility, a tool has, you'll be able to go to one place. So think of it as like the Yelp of EdTech, if you will. Um, we're doing a great job on creating some high level guidance and RFP language. So lots of different folks have those resources. Again, I'll share them in the chat. I'm not quite as gifted as Matt of, of two things at once. I'm still working on that competency and mastery. And then finally, I see this happening in other spaces. So um, quality standards that give folks clear indicators of what is quality and what isn't. So for example, the National Partnership for Student Success earlier this year, created quality standards around tutoring, mentoring, student success coaching, and community schools. So not just ed tech, but really a movement throughout education towards evidence. I'll turn it back to you, Yenda. Thank you so much for that really expansive view of what's going on in the policy landscape. We are so excited to share with you some real life examples of this partnership work. And I am going to start uh, with you, Monique. Uh, Monique, can you please share an example of ELSOL's partnership work with universities and community organizations to support evidence-based practices at your school? What I want to talk about are, are what we're doing in our real-life examples, but I, I want to back up just a little bit and say, from the school perspective, um, and how technology was used and where we are as, as schools and the kinds of decisions that we're making. Um, COVID-19 and our in-school to homeschool transition that happened overnight barreled us all at light speed into the future of technology. And as we all um, became accustomed to remote learning and the utilization of a variety of different technological tools. Um, we, we were working in a space that uh, was new for lots of teachers and overwhelming for everybody involved. And really also at the same time had to be prepared for a return to school and for making clear um, beneficial decisions about what to do and how to use this newfound uh, technological expertise. So then what are we gonna do? Um, at El Sol, we've been using, we've been engaged in university community partnerships for quite some time. And we have a lot of different uh, research projects going on from our Fraction Ball and our Park Parkopolis, which are playful learning landscape projects, uh, some dual language uh, engagement um, research. For the purposes of today, I want to talk about our elementary computing for all project that goes uh, that is related to the digital learning lab, a group um, in UCI education led by uh, Professor Mark Warshower. Um, the elementary computing for all this program seeks to develop computer science curriculum targeted at the needs of emerging mu multilingual children, especially those from low income Latino communities. In this kind of project, ELSOL and UCI have worked together to establish the more foundational types of evidence, which would be tier four, tier three. The small and agile nature of El Sol allows us to get research partnership projects up to scale quickly with less delays for district-wide approval in, uh, in other cases. We've piloted the curriculum and provided feedback from teachers and students, piloted outcome assessments that have assisted with measure development and made available data on student outcomes that is used for correlational analysis. Though none of these provide 
experimental results on outcomes, they are all key to establishing the promise of ed tech interventions and guiding their development. For example, we offer the first classes that has offered the curriculum in Spanish to our dual immersion students, providing insights into that implementation. We are also partnering with UCI to develop and pilot a new AI literacy curriculum for middle school students. And the fact that we have strong relationships with our teachers and share the same values with uh, our UCI uh, partners um, has resulted in the strong majority of our teachers implementing the curriculum, allowing us all to better understand scope and sequence across multiple grade levels. So this is really a win-win situation. Uh, we have cutting edge computer science curriculum targeted at the needs of our learners. And uh, while we also contribute to further development and refinement of it, so it can be implemented and evaluated at scale in larger di districts, which will happen next year. And, and then finally, I just wanna say that in schools, there's a couple things going on. One of them is a rush to innovation. Um, and then also is this idea of implementing research-based practices, but, what does that mean uh, when so much of the, the environment is consumerized and you're having to make decisions? And I think we've, we've heard a little bit about that already. Um, at El Sol, the reason we're engaged in this process is because we wanna demonstrate leadership around building evidence and, and understanding the research process and we really want to have agency over our own big questions, as Aaron was talking about, so that we can, we are active participants in understanding what we want to know, how we want to know it, and how it works in our context. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to go now to you, Sunil. As an ed tech developer, can you provide examples of how Age of Learning has partnered with schools to engage in evidence building across the different levels of evidence? Yeah, of course, Yanda. And to, to build up the, let me start by building up the toolkit and, and, and the perspective of uh, educational uh, developer and ed tech developer is that we all need to start with, um, a, to demonstrate a rationale that's tier four um, and, and it's simple. I mean, as you go and approach a school with your solution, yet you, you got to be really clear on what problem are you solving and you build up where it's from there in terms of additional evidence gathering. You know, when we started our process, uh, we, we absolutely wanted to impact uh, early childhood learning uh, in both math and reading. And our, you know, our theory of change was that, look, use our product and we're going to move your scores in math and reading for your youngest learners. Um, and you have to have that before I think it's, it's even right to ask a teacher or a classroom or a district or whoever to, to uh, implement your product in terms of, hey, let's test it with, with our students. Like they should know very clearly what you're trying to achieve. Um, and once we had done this and we'd actually done some... Uh, uh, at-home studies to ensure that we we were going to see some outcomes for kids. We jumped in feet first with a our first research study with U LA Unified on My Math Academy, which was a, a kindergarten classroom study. It was about ten to twelve weeks uh, in a high need area with over four hundred students in the study, um, and we partnered from the get go with uh, um, an institution like WestEd. Uh, to do a randomized control stu trial study. And, you know, look, these studies take a lot of time and effort and support. Our, our research team is uh, now six people uh, who focus just on all the evidence that we're gathering. And what we were able to find through this first study is that we, we, we had tier one results. And that is we had a randomized control trial uh, that had significant results. Um, not only is, are those results um, aligned with tier one per work we had done with Learn Platform. We also published those results in a peer reviewed journal of research on educational effectiveness. And that's a big part of uh, what we're trying to do is ensure that not only do we um, do the work with districts and getting the evidence that we get it out there that you know, our products can be effective in terms of educational technology. Last year, we completed our first uh, large scale study with uh, SRI on My Reading Academy and um, 
and that was across several states, and we found significant gains there as well. That's a tiers two study, and um, it is a difficult environment right now to conduct studies, but there are um, plenty of districts willing to do so if you provide the right incentives and 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 really come to them with problems that they know they need to solve and uh, work with them and the teachers to make it as flexible as possible in terms of the implementation. Uh, it's worthwhile noting, it, it, despite the difficulty in doing studies, we have six additional studies underway this year across multiple partners, not only with districts, uh, but with a virtual private school provider, a charter school, um, as well as with the Palm Beach Early Learning Coalition in Florida. Um, and, and, and Aaron spoke to this uh, in terms of you want to be able to show that your product is or your solutions are effective in multiple contexts. And that's why we have uh, 10 ESSA aligned studies already. Next year, we're kicking off uh, with WestEd um, a IES funded study. It's a three and a half million dollar innovation grant we got we received from the institution, uh, Institute of Educational Sciences to do a two year study on just my math academy with 66 schools across several states. Uh, we're also going to be running a RCT for my reading academy. So uh, please reach out if you have any interest uh, from any of the you uh, at districts. Uh, we'd love to partner with uh, one of you that's on the call here. Um, and look, the reason we have the evidence we have is we welcome uh, what Aaron was talking about, like the, the idea of an outcome-based contract where we uh, districts uh, can ensure there's going to be a fidelity in terms of implementation. We're happy because of the evidence we have to say yes. We will, we, you know, we'll we'll put uh, some skin in the game and say, um, you know, our payments are really based on let's let's get outcomes. I think that's really important, and if we can move the needle that way for uh, millions of kids, let's do it. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ying. As an education researcher, can you describe the co-design elements of your partnership work with children, parents, and schools? How have you engaged with participants to investigate and build evidence-based ed tech for kids? Absolutely, thank you. Um, just as some background, the research my group carries out typically has two parts. The first part is um, the development of the particular ed tech application, and the second part is the evaluation of the application. Um, so we engage in different forms of evidence building processes with our partners, depending on the stage and the nature of our uh, project. So I'm going to just share one example today. Um, so the project I'd like to talk about um, involves developing interactive versions of short science educational videos with an intelligent tutor. So the intelligent tutor um, interacts with students by asking them questions and then providing feedback as students watch the videos. Um, so this initiative is a collaboration among um, a diverse sectors, including uh, media producers, schools, um, a big shout out to Monique and Elso Academy, as well as students and their families. Um, so we collect different types of evidence from our partners. During the development phase, for instance, our media partners offered formative feedback for us to um, just ensure our design aligns with industrial practices and guidelines. We invited students to test um, whether the intelligent tutor's questions are clear to them. We also consulted with teachers to understand whether the tutor asked questions in a similar way as the teachers ask students questions in the classroom. Um, so we also conducted on-site field testing at schools to ensure that our program could run smoothly on school Wi-Fi and also in somewhat um, noisy classroom environments. Um, so at this stage, we work with a small number of participants. So this allows us to gather relevant evidence really quickly. And it will help us to compare and decide on the better design solution. We can then update and refine our design rapidly. So once we have a relatively stable version of our design, we moved on to the evaluation stage. So at this stage, we work with a larger pool of students. Usually um, it could be hundreds of students. And we typically use randomized controlled trials. 
Um, so in one of our evaluation studies, half of the students watched the educational videos with the intelligent tutor, and the other half watched the videos in their original format without any interaction uh, with the tutor. We then evaluated the students' understanding of the scientific concepts presented in the videos. So through this RCT, we found that students who engaged with the intelligent tutor indeed performed better than those who watched the non-interactive versions of the video. So this could provide us with some evidence how our programs improve students' learning upon the current resources. But this one thing that I wanted to uh, point out is that it's important to note that um, the positive results from one single study may not be sufficient. This echo um, what Sunil has mentioned. So we're currently replicating our studies with students from different backgrounds in different contexts to confirm um, similar outcomes. But it is very challenging for one research group to carry out this kind of expansive research. Um, so this is why we advocate for um, open science. So we share um, the source code of our program and also our data, of course, um, anonymized. This will allow other research groups to contribute to the evidence building process collectively. Thank you so much. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Pati to see what's happening with our first poll. Yeah, so we got some really great responses in our first poll, um, and our panelists can see the those responses. So I'm going to ask Matt to come on camera and kind of synthesize or give us some reactions to any of the responses that you saw. Yeah, you guys gave so much great feedback in the poll, but there are some really clear themes, and one of it uh, really is that ed tech moves so quickly, and there are so many products, and um, they can be difficult to know whether the specific product you're using or whether the version of the specific product you're using really has evidence of effectiveness. And that was probably more than 50% of the poll responses kind of got to one or both of those topics. And that's where I think what Aaron shared and what you've heard from our other presenters is really so exciting. Increasingly, there are infrastructures that are able to kind of keep pace with the number of products and different versions of products and specific uses of products and specific student populations that you're able to build evidence on a more rapid basis in a real local context. So it means something um, kind of particular and, and super relevant for you. So although I definitely feel the pain of folks saying we need more research, I think everything you just heard from our prior panelists tells you um, that there are good players in the advocacy community, in the industry community, in the education research community who are working to build that evidence with you. Um, and all that depends upon folks in buildings and states and districts to raise your hand uh, to be partners in that work. So if you're in a position to do that, um, please, when a researcher comes and asks, um, uh, be willing to take that leap. So that, that's what I see Patty, in, the, in the first take of the poll. No, that's great. Thank you. Appreciate uh, that summary and, and um, what you shared. I'm going to turn it over to Christina now for a little bit of a break. <laughs> I love that I get this, the former early childhood teacher. <laughs> um, please indulge me, everyone. Uh, we are going to do a little bit of a brain break here because we've been sitting together for about 50 minutes at this point. And as I said, with many of my former early learners, when your bum goes numb, so does your brain. So um, I would encourage you to stand up. Shake out your arms. Shake out your legs. And we're just going to cross the hemisphere is because we have been sitting so long. So we're going to cross our arms this way. I'm going to fold it up. So right now my left arm is on top of my right arm. And then I'm going to do it the other way. And fold that up. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and take a seat again, and let's do one deep breath, because why not? Um, we're going to do box breathing, if you've not heard of this. Think of drawing a line up a side of a square. So for four seconds, we're going to hold it for four seconds. We're going to let it out for four seconds, okay? Go ahead and inhale for four seconds. One, two, three, four. Hold it. One two, three, four. Now exhale slowly. One, two, three, four. Feels really good. Let's do one more. <laughs> Inhale. One, two, three, 
four, hold, one, two, three, four, and then release, one, two, three, four. That's all we needed to do to break things up. So thank you for indulging me. <laughs> thank you, Christina, for leading. Um, and that is a great transition to our second poll. So we have a second poll for you. Sana will be dropping a link in chat. It's the same link you had before. Um, please use pollev.com slash V-I-L-S. And I'm going to ask Yenda to come on the screen because she will be asking our panelists the same question that we are asking all of you. Thank you. So we will be doing a couple of things concurrently. While all of you uh, put your thoughts and responses to the question, um, I will ask uh, each of the panelists to give a brief uh, one to two minute uh, response. So again, the question is, how can education leaders, developers, and researchers support organizations and schools engaged in evidence building partnerships? And I think I am going to uh, start with you, Monique. Well, I, I, I think that one of the things that, that we have to consider it, when we're deciding to be in, engaged in evidence building partnerships are a, a, um, a review of both the opportunities, uh, benefits, and also the challenges and whether we're really up to the task. And, and for us, the opportunities that we see are um, in some cases, actual tools that we're getting. Uh, that we have access to, um, um, a real vetting of the information. Um, we get training, we get support. We have a whole background team that's that um, considers itself the research team, but actually becomes for us real live staff development. We get to engage in uh, critical conversations and, and develop really um, communities of practice that are important for us. And I think I did see somebody in the chat talk um, about a sense of urgency, particularly around AI, and is there time to wait for, for the evidence to build? And I think I would say that for us, we understand the urgency and having a partner um, that has these, these common goals and being engaged in these discussions and creating these communities of practice that really give us both immediate feedback and then longer term outcomes that are important for our deeper understanding about the in implications of our conversations. So um, I think th that's what we're evaluating. Those are some of the real practical like stipends for teachers. Uh, things like that that really help us, um, uh, and then, um, you know, really about being a true learning organization. Thank you so much. Um, I would like uh, Sunil to come on camera, and can you can you share your thoughts on the question? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, just to echo on what Monique said, it's. Uh, you, you want to make it as easy for school districts and your research partners as you can. It's uh, It's been a difficult last three years, and uh, there's a lot of challenges. So I think you first come in, and the discussion has to be, is what my product doing solving a problem for what your district has? And it was starting that conversation that way, and if, if it's a yes, and it, it, you can move to, well, we have something that if you use uh, with regular fidelity will produce gains for you. And let's test that. Let's make sure you um, we can provide your teachers something that's really plug and play, easy to use. I think going in and, and, and creating comfort that not only will this be easy to implement, it'll be easy for your, your teachers to use. And that, that includes uh, the amount, what it takes to get it up and running from a technical perspective and meeting all the privacy considerations that a school district is going to have and should have, as well as meeting the their needs in terms of how can I do this without uh, taking too much of the valuable time that my teachers don't have any of, right? So uh, ensuring that you've created a system that you're not asking 
uh, very much from the schools in terms of like solving from problems that you as the uh, developer should solve and be very aware of going into the conversation and uh, making it as easy as possible. And, and yes, incentives uh, for research studies are very commonplace and needed and necessary. And that is something you should budget for from the get-go and be very uh, open about how you are going to compensate districts that uh, participate in your studies. Thank you so much. Uh, Ying, can you give us your thoughts on the question? Yeah, thank you. So what I'm going to say really echoes a lot on what, um, what Monique and Sunil has mentioned. Um, so as a researcher, it is very important for us to think about how our partnerships could um, yield benefits for um, the schools, the students, and the broader community. So there are many different ways that we can make this process mutually beneficial depending on the nature of the research projects. For example, in some projects, we may um, introduce students um, innovative educational experiences that may not yield, um, be widely available for the students yet. Um, so our partnership could also um, equip schools with necessary equipments or tools that they could um, continue to use beyond the period of project. So those are some of the things that we could think about. Once you identify these common grounds where our project's objectives align with the needs of the schools and the community, it will um, better position us to build a more sustainable and um, fruitful partnership. Thank you so much. And uh, Pati, can I actually invite you to come back on camera? And I want to allow um, a good amount of time for our Q&A. So would love for you to facilitate that. And let's see what our audience um, has asked us. That sounds great. And then thank you, um, everyone, for your responses to our prepared questions. Now comes the fun time where we get to answer some of the questions that came up from the audience during the session. So I'm going to ask all of the panelists to come back on camera. And we're going to start with a question. Monique, you kind of responded to this a little bit earlier, but I want to make sure it's an important question. So I want to ask it again so that everyone can, can, I think this is what you were referring to earlier. It may not have been, but it's related. So the question is, my concern is that for the most emergent technology, AI, um, it is very difficult to specify requirements well without an interactive process with users. How do we evaluate such technology? Uh, how we evaluate such technology is a very hard problem. And yet we can't wait years to get evidence. How does the education community deal with this time lag problem in gathering evidence versus using it? Um, and Monique, I don't, I, I'm gonna go to you first um, so that you can add anything you'd like to this and, and we'll turn it over to others after that. Um, that that is the the question that I was referring to when I saw it. Um, I thought uh, that it was exactly framed as as the experience that we have at a at a school site, and particularly in something that we don't know yet all of the implications around and um, and and complicated by some real fear and anxiety about the outcomes and so and and therefore the sense of urgency um i i think that as i said the the um advantage of being in the conversation and and being able to generate um a series of of questions and answers as you work through the process it doesn't necessarily get you there any quicker, but at least you're engaged in the process and with others who are also committed to identifying ways to utilize something like that out in, in, in the classrooms as, as an educational tool. Thank you so much. Erin, I'm going to turn to you for a response next. Yeah, I think Monique brings up a good point, which is Something that I think all of our districts and researchers and developers should be thinking about is who defines the research question and how are you iterating on the research question throughout the process in the spirit of continuous improvement. And I think that's what we're all really focused on and is a good practice for emergent technologies. And then the good news is there's some folks who are starting to step up and really um, think about the use of AI in our communities, in our schools, in our human service 
um, agency. So IES has just funded two research institutions, which I think will rapidly speed up uh, along with the NSF. Some new um, information about AI in the context of education. We have our colleagues at Stanford who um, are really focused on creating opportunities for educators to sit with AI developers and large scale language models to make sure that education use cases are coming forward. We have great folks like AI EDU who are working in the field to create these places for research policy and practice to come together and have these conversations. The reality is we don't have time to wait likely for an RCT about the use of AI in uh, technology in technology tools right now because it's already starting to emerge and it's already in our tools. So what we can do is think about what are those best practice guidelines and guardrails. Later this year, NIST with the federal government will come out with some of those guidelines and guardrails around a risk framework, but also we're seeing folks like the EdSafe AI Alliance come forward with a pledge that they launch at BET which is all about setting these tables to bring educators, researchers, policymakers, users together to, and developers to have these conversations and to ask that really fundamental question. What is our research question? And are we iterating on that research question as we're using the tools in the field in the spirit of continuous improvement? That's the only way we're gonna be able to get at it. Thank you, Erin. Um, Ying, I'm going to turn it over to you for final thoughts on this question, and then we'll turn to another question. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with all of the panelists. And I just want to add one thing is that we may be able to look at more general evidence as well, which is um, what we have known about what kind of applications could better support students learning and uh, what kind of applications could better support um, teachers teaching, which go beyond the boundaries of a specific technologies and or, or a specific applications. For example, we have very solid evidence showing that applications um, providing immediate feedback to students could um, be highly beneficial. And then with this guidance, we may be able to look for um, AI products that could provide this kind of support. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next question is, what are some recommended ways to engage districts and teachers in product discovery research? Would anyone like to take this one first? You know, I Ian? can. Yeah, Go let ahead. me. Thank let you. Me. Yeah, sure. It goes back to what I said before, is the discussion has to be around what do I need to improve as a district? And and, and they're best equipped to know that. Like what if I need to see improvements, let's say in early education to ensure, and we know most schools do, or most uh, districts do need to improve outcomes, uh, whether it be for kindergarten readiness or for their um, first standardized test at, at you know, whether in third grade, and they're seeing their scores are not where they need to be or for specific populations, then let's, focus on that in terms of that's an area of need, we need to solve for this. Uh, there are not current solutions that we know that are evidence-backed or evidence are, are effective. Um, and, and, and then, you know, how do you um, find those solutions and, and then work with the schools to, to make that happen is a, is, is a part of the discovery process. I saw one of the earlier questions and I know Aaron, you and I have talked a lot about the, uh, the availability or accessibility to evidence information, a lot of times it is hidden behind uh, uh, paywalls of some uh, some research uh, publication, right? And uh, I know uh, Aaron it would be probably useful to talk about Birdie and how that can help, help and as well as some things like the EdTech Ed product uh, 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 product index, right? Uh, we need to have more sources so that uh, districts can look for and find things that are already effective or that want to be effective and need you know, research partners. Thank you, Sunil. Um, does anyone else wanna say anything about partnerships? Matt, would you like to jump in at all? Yeah, sure. So IES has, through our Regional Education Labs program, about 80 given partnerships at any given time with folks who are on the ground in schools, um, districts, and states. And I guess the thing I would echo that I've heard folks say is, 
we really have to make it as easy as possible for the classroom educators, the folks who are putting the technology into practice every day, make it as easy as possible for them to participate in the research, both to shape the direction, but also to actually use the technology and participate as full partners in the work. And so part of that, I think, um, not, to, not to tell anybody how they ought to think about structuring their programs, I think part of that's on the developers, right? To also think about, am I building a product that fits nicely in the education technology ecosystem that partners can use so my teachers don't have to do some extra data collection necessarily to get the information needed to generate evidence of effectiveness. It's baked into the product. I mean, Aaron talked about the iterative nature of this and it really is. I hope the developers are thinking about, can I make this data gathering, this data aggregation, this kind of experimentation, just a feature of my product, not something special or extra. That's just part of the business process. Because we all know when someone asks us to do something that's not part of our regular business process, it just doesn't happen because there's too much else going on. And when you have 30 children in front of you, you can't take time to do yet something different, right? But if it's baked into the product as part of how it's done every day, then I think it becomes tenable. So it's both this engagement with the educators around real problems, making it really feasible, and then lightening the research load. I know that's something that Erin and her team think a lot about in the technologies and um, systems they're developing. Can, can I just say, I, you know, I, I come from a long time ago. So when, when a single computer, ed tech was a single computer that got introduced into a classroom and sat in the corner because, you know, it, it was an accessory more than it was anything else. And, and it was years before it was actually anything else. Um, so I, I really think help understanding where teachers are uh, with regard to their comfort level, with regard to their capacity, and, and as everybody's already said, balancing that against um, really what it's been like to transition back into, into the workplace, and also knowing that Everybody who's working in the classroom wants the best for students, but wants to be able to, to engage effectively and uh, efficiently and also easily. Um, because in fact, there are lots of little ones uh, who, who are the energy in the room uh, at all times. So um, I, I, I think of um, just being realistic about all of that helps make build relationships that are are built on trust and and really the knowledge of who each other is. Thank you, Monique. Yes, that's important. Um, we are going to wrap up with one last prepared question for the panelists. This one's going to go to everyone. So Aaron, I'm going to start with you. And the question is, can you please share one benefit, challenge, and a lesson you learned uh, from your partnership with schools, um, and it can be one or um, a combination of those benefit, challenge, and lesson learned. I'm going to cheat a little bit because um, that's what I do. Uh, so first, I just want to say that this work takes real time and effort. And for anybody who um, is on the call who's thinking about partnering with schools, buying pizza for educators is not compensation. Buying pizza is not compensation. You have to spend real time and effort and value educators. But I do really want to go back to the point that I was making when Monique was talking about emerging technologies, which is who defines the research question. Every school, every educator needs to, to be at the table with researchers to make sure that they're getting real value out of a question that matters to them. And do you know what that's going to help you do? That's going to help you understand what data needs to be collected, how to maintain data privacy and security, what resources and tools you're going to potentially get out of this, what promises and obligations you're making for teachers. And transparency here in partnership is the secret to these practices being successful and used in evidence. And as someone who's run schools and been part of RPPs, Nothing was more frustrating as an educator 
than when I thought I signed up for something one way and it turned out it was something different. That's hard when you're the leader. It's hard when you're the teacher. It's hard when you're the parent. It's hard when you're the student in the experience. So let's be transparent. Let's be clear. Let's define the research question together and then figure out how we talk about what we've learned. Thank you, Erin. Monique, you're next. Okay, I just wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, we have um, a, a school community made, made up of those who have particular um, a focus and particular need. We have a, a high um, Latino population. We have a high English language learners. Uh, they're learning in two languages. Um, we have a particular point of view and a particular experience. And I think we want to make sure that as we're partnering with people, um, it's those who value, respect, and 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 really encourage bringing multiple voices and multiple experiences into the conversation about what works and for whom. And so uh, that's why it's important for us to be in it, but it that that's also why it's important for us to have partners who share those values of community and um, inclusivity and and the importance of all voices. Thank you, Monique. Uh, Sunil, same question. Yeah, follow up on what Monique said. It, it it's uh, respecting the partnership and respecting that you are entering sacred ground when you bring your solution to a a school and school district, and that every one of those children is not your experimental subject. It, they are somebody's child and you need to honor that and ensure that your solution was meant for them and was intended to provide them results. And if if that's uh, not the case, don't, don't push that agenda that I need to do a research study with you, go somewhere else. And I think if you go in there with that respect for how important it is, how important uh, those kids are to those teachers and to those families, um, I think you'll go a long way towards uh, um, finding the right partnerships that that uh, make a difference. Very important. Yes, thank you, Sunil. Uh, Ying? So I'm going to just add a little bit. Um, because schools are um, very complex and the implementation is very complex too. So we need um, kind of nuanced and comprehensive approaches to building our evidence. Even though um, a lot of time our primary goal is to gather evidence on learning and teaching, but when we work with the schools, it would be beneficial for us to look broader at other um, relevant elements such as teacher professional development, the existing um, school infrastructure or the um, particular socioeconomic characteristics of the schools and the district. So this could help us understand not only whether an ad tech solution works, but also how it works and um, why it works. Thank you, Ying. And Matt, we'll wrap up with you. Yeah, I think I just pick up on something that Monique uh, uh, began to raise, which is whenever I do a project like this, whether it's ed tech or otherwise, I'm reminded that classroom educators are natural social scientists. They're natural researchers. Every single day, a teacher goes into the classroom with a plan to help educate their students. They put themselves out there, they try something, and they give this immediate feedback from the children with whom they're working. Every night they go home, they think about the professional practice, and they change something up. And so I would say, Never underestimate the capacity of the educators and the buildings or the districts or wherever you're working to be real partners with you in the research. They may not have the RCT training that some of us have, but that's not necessary. In their genes uh, is this desire to do better and improve every day. And so if you can honor their expertise as much as you hope they honor yours, you will uh, be miles ahead in the research you're trying to do in partnership with them. Thank you, Matt. Um, and we are going to uh, start getting some closing thoughts from each of our panelists. Before we do that, I'm going to ask participants to please drop your own closing thoughts in the chat. Um, we are going to start with Monique and go through each of the panelists with their 30 second wrap up closing thought. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Yenda for some final thoughts uh, to end the session. 
So again, starting with Monique, 30 seconds. Okay, well, I wasn't ready. I, I, I think Christina said in the beginning that, that there wasn't going to be any closure. And uh, I'm definitely with her on that piece because I thought an hour and a half was gonna be a really long time. And I feel like uh, we're just scratching the surface of this conversation and, and, and some of the important elements. Um, I do appreciate um, all of the appreciation uh, in the chat for, for teachers and schools and, and the complex nature of the work. Um, some of the ongoing exhaustion, but but also the, the never ending enthusiasm for bringing education to life and, and, and really wanting to be able to use education as a tool to do that because we all want, want what's best for students and, and families and community. Thank you, Monique. Matt, you're next. Yeah, again, I don't know that I can get closer either to this experience, but what I can say is that our door here is always open and we really do want to hear about how we can support you, whether you're in a school, whether you're in a district, whether you're in a state, whether you're a developer, whatever your role. I'm um, here at IS, our job really is to support your work in teaching and learning and innovation and discovery. So um, this is my personal invitation to you. Um, we're really creative here at the Department of Education about how to get in touch with us. Our email addresses are very, very simple firstname.lastname at ed.gov. Reach out to me anytime. Um, I would be more than glad to talk with you guys about this in more length because um, this is really critical, important work and getting more important every single day. Thank you. Ying? Thank you. So I'm not ready to end this conversation either, um, but as a researcher, um, so our ultimate hope is that our collaboration with schools, with our media producers and the students is not just about research or um, gathering evidence. So what we hope is that through our research, we could make um, tangible and positive impact to the students and to our society. Thank you, Ying. Sunil? I'm, I'm super excited to um, see all the focus on evidence and, and, and improving outcomes that we're doing here that have been happening in terms of building out that ecosystem over the last two years, which I think perfectly prepares us for what opportunity we have with educational technology and AI to really transform education in this country and deliver to all of our students what they deserve in terms of outcomes and to prepare them for this new world. And uh, so it's been great to be on this part of this conversation. I look forward to continuing it as we make uh, an evidence a part of everybody's vocabulary. Thank you, Sunil. And Erin, we'll close out with you. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, I want to just start with gratitude and thank everybody on this call. I've learned a lot in the chat and I've learned a lot from fellow panelists. So thanks for all the knowledge and wisdom that folks have contributed to this conversation. I really feel like we're just getting started. The age of evidence is really upon us and it's gonna be incumbent upon so many of us, not just on this call, but around this ecosystem to make sure that we can help schools, districts, and families embrace evidence in the way they make solutions about their education. Let's get started. Thank you, Erin, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I'm gonna invite Yenda to wrap up with some closing remarks. Thank you to our panelists and to all of you joining us. Um, before I turn it over to Christina, I really just want to emphasize that we are here to democratize science. <laughs> we are here to help support the idea that schools are already using evidence and that we need to be supporting them in those endeavors. We need to be supporting all of you. Um, at the Office of Ed Tech, we do that by listening to what you have to say. So thank you all for coming. Um, just want to make a couple of notes. Uh, we will be uh, sharing a tiny URL form. Please give us your feedback, um, especially those lingering questions that you asked if they did, did not get answered. We want to hear um, because we will be developing more resources. So please, please, please continue to send us your questions. Um, also want to say that all, all the links have been provided, but again, go to tech.ed.gov backslash evidence um, to see the work that we're doing in the space. And finally, we will make a recording of the session available to you in the near future. And now I will turn it over to our wonderful leader, Christina. 
Thanks so much. Um, thank you all so much for your time today, your interest in this important topic. Um, there are many things competing for your time and attention. So for you to take 90 minutes and join us means the world, truly. So on behalf of Secretary Cardona, Assistant Secretary Roberto Rodriguez, who helps oversee the Office of Ed Tech, and myself, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope the conversation continues. Again, you have all of the ways to stay in touch with us, and we want to be at your service. So please make sure that you take advantage of that, um, and we wish you a great rest of your school year. Thank you so much.